Hello, so let us continue our discussion related to the various payment design methods. I just gave you a overview of uh, IRC. I am all sure that you know you would have done extensive calculations related to the same. Then we went to South Africa and then we went to Australia and then finally we are going to go to United States of America. Now most of the developments related to the analysis, design of payments, material characterization, everything started more or less with the, the United States of America. The earlier ASHTO road test and later what it become as ASHTO, ASHTO design gate and the concept of mechanistic empirical payment design method in addition to the earlier versions of software such as Darwin and right now what is really called as the ASHTO where have all uh, provided us a very rigorous framework for analyzing and designing bituminous payment. Now, if I have to teach ASHTO, it has to be a separate easily 10 to 15 hours of an NPTEL course or if you come and sit in my class, uh, you are going to look at at least 4 weeks of classroom sessions. Typically at IIT Madras, we teach 50 minutes per class. So, if I have 3 classes per week or 4 classes per week, you are looking at 4 weeks. So, that much of extensive information has to be provided to you. So, this is in terms of uh, how to understand traffic, how to understand the materials, how to do distress characterization. How are these distress transfer functions generated? Okay, what about reliability uh, and so on? It goes. It is a detailed calculations that we one needs to do that. Right now, what I am going to do is to kind of give you a overview of it, a snapshot of it because then you can immediately understand ok. So, this is how a payment design should be done. Many practitioners will say that oh this recent version of Ashtoware is a overkill because you are looking at getting so much of data you know more than 150 plus uh, kind of a parameters that needs to be input into the system, analysis has to be done. So, that is one school of thought, but uh, from the students perspective you need to have a comprehensive background about the most sophisticated payment design method as of now available and that is what we are going to do now. So, this is the interim report that was submitted the mechanistic empirical payment design guide what is really called as the MEPDG and the manual of practice this is the interim edition July 2008. So, this is the version that I have with me and all my discussions are going to be based on this. Okay, right. Where is the starting point of all these things? So, we need to kind of have a general idea about how all these things happen. So, this is the starting point for this is the ASHO road test. There is a detailed highway research board bulletin 1961 in which all these details are provided. So, now this construction was between 1956 to 1958 traffic application was from 1958 to 1960 and the test facilities are 6 2 lane loops were given here. And in fact, you can actually see that this is the test tangent, there is a pre-stressed concrete section, flexible payment, rigid payment. Of course, we said we will not use flexible and rigid, bituminous and concrete, but again this is 1961. So, you know what I am talking about. So, this is the whole thing that are seen here. Okay. And then you will also see that various what I am showing you here is 6 2 lane loops, I am showing you loop 5 and loop 6. So, if you take a look at loop 5 and loop 6, these were the loads that were applied. The front axle is uh, 6, uh, 6000 pounds, the rear axle is 22.4. See like that these loads were basically applied and you can actually see the overall gross weight that was used here. 
that is the uh, whole idea behind this and in fact this 18 should be something that should be give you uh, some idea about what we are talking about. So, what was the basically the outcome of the Asho road test? The Asho road test came out with the concept of the equivalent single axial load. So, W x by W 18 and similarly you can actually see that these are the various equations that were used and this is completely different for uh, uh, bituminous pavement as well as concrete pavement. And these are things that have already been discussed in uh, re relatively simple terms in some earlier lectures. So, what is the uh, genesis of this whole thing? So, the first bituminous payment guideline was released in 1961. The next year they released the concrete payment uh, guidelines. Then they integrated everything and released one ASHTO, ASHO interim guide for the uh, design of payments 1972 and then there were some revisions that were made in 1981 uh, basically stiffness uh, modulus, various calibration factors and the stress ratios that are used. Uh, in fact, if you go back and take a look at some of the concrete payment design methods, so this PCA method of payment design in which you are relating about the stress ratios, uh, flexural stress ratios with the modulus of rupture, all those things actually came in here. But we are not really talking about concrete pavement in this course. So, these are all the things that uh, happened in the 1986 version. Okay. First and foremost thing, very clearly reliability was integrated, number one. Number two is uh, resilient modulus for soil support. So, they did away with uh, CBR, R value and all those things and then they came out with a pressure dependent resilient modulus. Drainage was explicitly taken into account. Improved environmental considerations were taken into account and various environmental related models that influence the mechanical response of the materials were calibrated and validated and integrated with the pavement design. Then extension of the load equivalency values are also taken into account and improved traffic data. And this is the most important thing. They not only stopped at collecting the data before the design, they also monitored the response of the pavement for the continuous traffic loading conditions to which a new pavement is constructed and then used that information to keep validating their distress models. Layer coefficients came because you started talking about the structural number and all those things. How to do the rehabilitation that also was taken into account. Then this was integrated part of the pavement design method. So, this is how ideally one should have a comprehensive framework. So, we need to take a pass here. It is not that uh, these things do not really exist within the IRC guidelines that we have, but they are all at different places. So, somebody who designs the payment uh, has to have this information so that one can integrate this as part of the life cycle process. Payment management information was considered and in addition design of payments for the low volume roads. So, you have an IRC guideline which is majorly influenced by the ASHTO method of payment design and state of the knowledge on mechanistic empirical design concepts were evolved. In, in fact, they also understood that you need to go to the next level that is what really happened. Then this was something called as the long term payment performance LTPP. So, what was happening was detailed data was collected on major sections. Okay. So, you can actually see a uh, test tracks from which such kind of a data were collected and this test tracks uh, uh, were throughout the uh, entire you can see the United States map and in fact, you can actually see. So, these are the general purpose and special purpose payment sites. So, whichever is green given in blue color are the general purpose. So, which means there are see for instance you know there are highways that go from 
south all the way to the north and in fact i strongly suggest that you go take a look at the interstate uh, uh, map of uh, united states so you will understand what i really mean it will also be interesting for you to understand how these states are divided like this okay so in our country we the uh, division of the state is based on language as we all we have read in our history book but here the divisions are completely different but what you really need to do is they basically have a criss crossed highway system that was going like this and similarly you had highway systems like this and at each and every location you saw that uh, there are some uh, long term payment performance test sections now this massive data was collected assimilated and uh, what are all the data that were collected from all these things they collected the climate data they collected the material properties they collected what is the load that was coming in the response was also calibrated and validated and finally they were in the process of developing the distress models see that is the whole idea so your material response is going to depend on which location it is being uh, constructed right so the variability in the traffic variability in the material and in the performance so this is the analysis that was carried out see because what will happen you might design your payment for a specific axial load combinations but after the payment is constructed the traffic that is going to come can be considerably different that's number 1 number 2 is if you are a highway engineer and you will understand this very clearly you might design a, let us say a bituminous concrete grade 2 let us say with 5.3 or 5.4% bitumen content and then when you go to the site and uh, uh, take the mix and see it it has not it is something to do with the variability that one has to face considering uh, you know that uh, thousands and thousands of tons of bituminous material that is being laid in fact just to give an example typically in a day in hma construction if you have a excellent contractor he might do more than 1000 tons per day i am talking about a new four lane road or a rehabilitation exercise that is happening so when in that 1000 tons it is extremely going to be difficult to maintain that 5.2 5.3% of binder content so there is going to be a variability because of the variability the modulus values will change and because the modulus values change the response of your pavement structure also will change okay so these needs to be clearly categorized and data collected development of an improved design process this resulted in this mechanistic empirical pavement design guide and then we also want to compare various pavement cross sections related to their performance and then you do the field validation of the pavement design procedure and in addition to this there is a new dynamic modulus program was started and in fact if you go take a look at the mechanical characterization of bituminous material which is an uh, earlier nptel course that we offered you will see that we discuss in detail the new the dynamic modulus test and in fact at iit madras where i teach and research for the last 18 19 years we have the testing facilities for measuring the dynamic modulus as a function of frequency and temperature so then uh, this whole thing now has to be translated into a new design code so they came out with the national cooperative highway research program uh, 37a so this resulted in the mepdg design guide so the climate impact the material aging properties and axial load spectra for predicting the pavement distress and in fact they basically ditched the load equivalency factor and then they said we will take the actual axial load apply it on the pavement and compute the damage so these are all some of the failure modes that was considered here okay and finally this what i showed you in the starting of this lecture this book came and there was also a ashtover payment me design software that also came okay so now with all this background let us uh, redefine what is really called as mechanistic what is really called as empirical 
we also made some statements similar to this earlier but let us do it again analytical calculations for transforming pavement loading that is truck and climate and inherent material properties to critical pavement responses stress strain or deflection okay no damage stress strain or deflection this is the mechanistic what is empirical this is where things become slightly fussy empirical is relate the pavement responses what are the thing? stress strain deflection to uh, relate this to the observed distress what is really called as rutting this could be fatigue faulting iri this comes more from the functional okay so that also happened but why do we really need now mepdg because you know you must be listening to this 30 hours are going on and you have looked into various issues related to pavement design do we really need a new method you really need a new method a better method because what is really happening is the vehicle types axle loading and tire pressures are very uh, mean in fact many years back you must have noticed there were only hardly two trucks in this country there was a fargo there was an ashok leyland maybe a tata now you can think about look at the kind of trucks that are available in this country look at the kind of loading that they really carry in this country so what we really need is if we have to address the challenges associated with such kind of a diverse range of axle loads trucks and traffic we need a much better and superior pavement design method and then we also need to incorporate material parameters that better related to pavement performance right now if someone asks you you have some modulus values that you have measured in the laboratory and can i tell you whether this modulus property will be uh, give me some indication of the expected rutting not really and that is why you know you have different sets of material properties that you do one that is related to modulus determination another is related to the laboratory distress measurement and then finally you are talking in terms of local material in addition i will also want to add something here about wrap reclaimed asphalt pavement material so then there are also few other things that we need to important thing because the binder ages when the binder is aging what happens the modulus value increases so what should we really do so when the modulus value increase the manner in which the pavement will carry the load keeps changing there may be sub sudden uh, initiation of fatigue cracks that can happen fatigue damage that can happen that also is one possibility and this also gives you some kind of guideline about what binder what mixer should ideally be used improve the characterization of the existing pavement layer parameters okay so we have already constructed a pavement let us say with irc 37 and now you want to check whether this existing pavement uh, how how much it will perform how long it will perform by using any pdg can we do that yes we can do then improve the reliability of the pavement performance prediction so what are all the steps so we will spend some time talking about the traffic load characterization of the material climate performance prediction and also characterization of the existing pavement structure so we may not really talk about this i will give you a short overview of about the various performance prediction climate material characterization and traffic load okay right so what is that again the typical methodology select the trial pavement section remember we are only doing a proof checking calculate stresses strains and deflection now for all the axle load there is no load equivalency factor compute the incremental damage this incremental damage is going to be separately for each load application for rutting load related cracking non road related cracking check the reliability and now you see that iri comes in so this is the functional requirement check for the iri now you have a separate model here for iri okay and then if the design criteria is met yes otherwise 
you basically modify the design. And here there are few other things that need to be uh, mentioned. What is really called as the local calibration? So, whenever a pavement is uh, designed, it is going to be designed for a general broad based framework. See, for instance, if you go take a look at this transfer functions, this transfer functions will vary depending on the location. The bituminous mixture, if the bituminous mixture may be the same, but if it is subjected to identical load, one at Nagpur, one at Chennai, they are not going to behave in the same way. That is basically because of the temperature conditions that exist. The truck applied that is going on on the roads of Chennai may be at a going at a much slower speed compared to what you see at Nagpur. So, the loading rate sensitivity also plays a critical role here. So, that means you are talking in terms of local materials. Okay. I mean I mentioned the same bituminous mixtures, but ideally what will happen let us say if you are constructing a road in uh, Tamil Nadu, you will be taking the material from uh, bitumen from Chennai Petroleum. If you are constructing something in uh, uh, Andhra, you probably will get it from Vishagapatnam refinery. So, the binder changes if we think that if it is we specify VG 30 grade of bitumen it will all be the same, it will not be the same. Okay, That is a story for different course, but as of now local materials. You can talk in terms of aggregate specific gravities. I know for a fact that some of the road projects for which we did some gave some technical assistance let us say Jaipur and all, uh, the specific gravities go all the way up to 2.95, whereas the aggregates that are available in uh, Tamil Nadu they may not uh, exceed 2.80. So, there is a big difference in the uh, material that is used. So, local material, local climate, local traffic and other local inputs should enter the ME analysis, predict the distress profile and then compare it this with the measured distress profile and then you need to keep adjusting the calibration factor. We may not be able to show you how to do the calibration and adjust the calibration factor, but this is the overall idea. Now, let us take a look at the cross section that is provided here. Okay. So, now let us look at each of these things separately. Okay. So, let us take a look at the conventional bituminous pavement you can have HMA 1 to 3 layers number 1. Then you can have an asphalt treated permeable base, you can have unground aggregates again 1 to 3 layers, you can have uh, stabilized subgrade, improved subgrade or whatever it is, then this is your foundation soil and this is what is really called as the bedrock. So, if it is a full depth pavement, you can actually see that asphalt institute method of pavement design, it is going to be a full depth HMA and then you are going to have an asphalt rated base and then you are going to have an asphalt rated permeable base that is what is going to be there. Deep strength pavement are going to have bituminous material, asphalt rated base, you are going to have asphalt rated permeable base and then you are going to have granular material. The semi rigid pavement you are going to have bituminous material, cementitious stabilized base, unbound aggregate base and here I just give need to give you one caution. Uh, some of you have asked this questions in some of the uh, earlier uh, discussions that we have been having informally with some of you is the following. So, what is this inverted pavement, what do we do really and all. So, one needs to understand very carefully. Uh, the layered linear elastic theories that are used for computing the stresses and strain have some strict assumptions related to the variation of modulus values. So, that means you know E 1 greater than or equal to E 2 greater than or equal to E 3 and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you really want to compute the uh, stresses and strains in an inverted payment, I would always suggest that you use something like a finite element package. Abacus or something like that. At least if uh, your bituminous layer below the bituminous layer, if you have a granular layer and if you then have a, a CTB below the granular layer, which is normally seen in some of the inverted pavement cross sections, 
then you might end up with some erroneous results. One needs to be very careful. I won't get into those details here because that basically means I need to ask you to do the analysis using a numerical method and many of you may not necessarily have the background to do those things. So, my suggestion to you is to stick to IRC 37, look at some of the example problems that have been worked out in IRC 37 as well as the problems that have been worked out by Professor Padma. So, I think that should be suffice for that. So, let me introduce few definitions for this session of this lecture and then in the next lecture what I would do is to talk about traffic, material properties and the distress functions. Okay, right. So, first and foremost thing is and this is definitions are very important and if you are uh, uh, listening to this lecture at least you may want to write some of this uh, uh, underlying words that you have. Okay, so, what is a calibration factor? Adjustments applied to the coefficients and or exponents of the transfer function to eliminate bias between the predicted and the measured payment distress. So, these are your calibration factors. So, these calibration factors can be global or these calibration factors can be local. Second definition, set of definition. One needs to be very clear here because of the fact that MEPDG will exclude any damage that is caused by the construction traffic. Okay. So, now what is construction month? The month and year that the unbound layers have been compacted and finished and the month and year that the HMA has been placed to cover the unbound layer. So, so this is your construction month. What is the traffic open month? This is the month and year that the roadway is open to the public. Now, this is actually in a sense very important. If you really understand that the granular layers when they are being constructed, they are being subjected to substantial amount of loading by the construction machinery and in fact during that time these materials fail and that is why you use the concept of resilient modulus because what you typically do is you take this granular material start uh, subjecting it to variable passes compaction and so the material uh, deforms plastically and then reaches an optimal interlocked state in which you know uh, now you can call it as the reference state. Subsequently when the load is being applied in terms of uh, the HMA layers that are being constructed on top of it, it reaches the so called shakedown state or the resilient state from where you can actually start measuring the modulus value. So, this is the idea behind this uh, specific definition of construction month as well as the traffic open month. Now, comes what is really called as the threshold value. It represents the amount of distress or roughness that would trigger some type of major rehabilitation activity. So, this is where you are waiting let us say the IRI value or the rutting that you measure. You basically say if it crosses 5 mm I need to go for a rehabilitation that is the threshold value. And now comes the most important definition what is called as the design life. The time from initial construction until the pavement has structurally deteriorated to the point when significant rehabilitation or reconstruction is needed. Please understand this is called as define design life here. So, let us not get confused here. Now, another uh, two other uh, definitions are introduced what is called as an endurance limit the tensile strain or stress below which no load related fatigue damage occurs. Okay. To me this is a very important uh, concept because you know you can actually ask this question. Okay. So, I have this commercial vehicle which has a laden weight of 4 tonnes. Will it cause damage to it? You know intuitively that it may not cause damage, but you need to put a number. So, I am going to say the following, if the strains are of the order of 1 into 10 power minus 5, no matter what happens, there is not going to be any fatigue damage that is going to happen. If instead 
if it becomes 10 power minus 4 or 10 power minus 3, then you are going to say that there is a load related damage that can actually get accumulated that is endurance limit. What is this incremental damage? Incremental damage is so let us take the case of uh, a axle load that causes a strain of 1 into 10 power minus 3. Now, this has to be related to some kind of a damage, a ratio which is defined by the <coughs> actual number of weed applications for a specific axle load and type within an interval of time divided by the allowable number of wheel load applications defined for the same axle load and type for the conditions that exist within. So, you are talking in terms of n by n. If this axle load is applied for n, there is a capital N, there is going to be a damage. If it is applied for n, which is the small n, there is an incremental damage. So, this is defined as the incremental damage and few other definitions, long life payments. Okay. So, uh, um, this is something that I really think we should not really be worrying about in a country like India because uh, uh, it is possible for a country like United States to think in terms of uh, long life payment and design something for a 50 year service life. Our country is still growing, still evolving. We, yet, we are yet to have idea about the load distributions uh, that we are going to expect in our highway. So, designing something for more than 5 years or, or maybe maximum 30 MSA or 40 MSA is something that I would not really think about it. And then what about that reliability of the trial design? The probability that the predicted performance indicator of the trial design will not exceed the design criteria within the design analysis period. I am just restating these definitions so that you will have clear clarity about it. Then comes the transfer function. Now, this is the empirical part, empirical part of the distress prediction model that relates the critical payment response parameter either directly or through the damage concept to payment distress. So, this is your distress transfer function. So, we will be seeing some of this distress transfer function in the next lecture. Okay. So, thank you so much. 